Hi y'all and welcome back to the channel. I'm going to be formatting this a bit differently, just playing with ideas of how I might want to do some videos in the future. I hope you enjoy and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Often, when we talk about the founding of the United States, the concepts we discuss are more like goals that the country needed time to realize. Society was evolving, the enlightenment was still going on, people were still developing ideas, and certainly when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and included the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, at that time, we know not all Americans were treated equal, right? Whether we talk about abolition or women's rights or the treatment of American Indians, we know that certain things took time to realize. It is what it is. You know, we can't change that. That's not the topic of this video, but these things evolve. And what I want to talk about here is how the idea of religious freedom also took time to realize and has evolved since the founding of this country. When the First Amendment was added, saying, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, their idea of what that meant was far more limited than how we look at it now. And I'm not even talking about the separation of church and state issue. It varied by state, but there were religious tests for government positions, and of course, certain denominations were more prevalent in certain colonies. So, for example, in Massachusetts, they would have wanted a Congregationalist politician because that was the typical form of Christianity there. It was Puritanism, basically. And if I remember right, they actually did have a state religion for a while following the revolution. Y'all can feel free to correct me and talk about it in the comments below if you want. Um, those of you who've been here for a while, you know that Massachusetts isn't really my, my focus of research. Um, anyway, then in Virginia, they'd want an Anglican. There were many religious dissenters in Virginia, like Baptists or Methodists or Quakers, but Anglican were the majority. They had a long history in Virginia. They were respected and the men of power in Virginia tended to be Anglican. So now people talk about this being a Christian nation, but the funny thing to me is that if we talk to a lot of colonists at the time of the American Revolution, they probably didn't consider a Congregationalist, an Anglican, a Baptist to be the same thing. They all worshiped the same God, but the denominational differences were a bigger deal than I think we consider them now. Religious dissenters in Virginia, like Baptists, were still being jailed at the time of the revolution. So clearly the establishment considered them to be very different. So for a time, the states just continued doing their own thing after the American Revolution, and nobody was really going to mess with that. What ended up being a precedent used for later interpretations of the First Amendment began with a dispute in Virginia. And that's the story we are slowly getting to in this video. Now, during the revolution, the religious dissenters in Virginia had used the leverage they got from the war to ensure a little more toleration. Basically, they said, you know, if you want us to fight in support of this revolution, if you want us to help supply goods to support the army for this revolution, then you have to respect our beliefs. It wasn't foolproof, and as soon as the war ended, there began to be controversy and various concerns because they had no legal protections. You know, they'd put their foot down during the war itself, but no laws had been overturned. There really wasn't anything preventing a return to the previous status quo. So let's backtrack a bit for context, and let's talk about that early history of those dissenters in the colony of Virginia and what led to this. That's really where I want us to start, and I think we have to start there to understand the petition campaign we will talk about later in the video. From the founding of Jamestown in 1607, the Church of England had a foothold in Virginia. 
the Anglican Church was the established church, and Virginia was soon divided into taxpayer-supported parishes. The first group of dissenters to gain a following within the colony would have been the Quakers in the late 1650s, but pretty soon afterward, the colonial legislature began to target them. Quaker missionaries left the colony voluntarily or they got deported. Virginians who had converted to Quakerism, they received fines and were whipped. But no matter how much the legislature tried, they persisted. They persevered within the colony. Some qu number of Quakers remained whether they liked it or not. Decades later, in 1689, the Protestant King William and Queen Mary had taken the English throne from Mary's Catholic father, King James II, in what is called the Glorious Revolution. William and Mary issue what is often known as the English Toleration Act, and it exempted Protestant religious dissenters from legal penalties so long as they followed certain rules. So in theory, a lot of the religious dissenters in Virginia should have been good to go. But this act gets applied inconsistently in the colonies. Thomas Jefferson wrote in his Notes on the State of Virginia that Virginia's laws penalized people who denied certain tenets of what we might call mainstream Christianity for that time. If the person disputed the common, or rather Anglican, interpretation of who God is, or denied that the Bible was divinely inspired, then, quote, he is punishable on the first offense by incapacity to hold any office or employment, ecclesiastical, civil, or military, end quote. If the person did so a second time, they could no longer sue someone in court, and they would be incarcerated for three years. Also, after the second offense, a father could lose custody of his children. So that was a pretty big deal. But despite all of this, the dissenters kept coming. Religious toleration in Virginia was dependent on who held positions of power. Governor William Gooch, a Scot, had no desire to persecute dissenters, and he was a friend to the Presbyterians. So Gooch welcomed dissenters, mainly the Scots-Irish Presbyterians, to the Shenandoah Valley beginning in the 1730s. They were joined by Quakers, Mennonites, Lutherans, German Reformed, and Baptists. Generally, those dissenters on the frontier faced less religious persecution than those living further east. And on a practical note, they also kind of provided a buffer and protected the influential people back east from attacks by the French or American Indians. So in 1747, a proclamation of the council instructed local magistrates to limit itinerant preachers and then Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie later sought to limit the meeting houses of dissenters, even if their clergymen were licensed. But the thing was that life for religious dissenters was pretty hard anywhere. So they kept coming. Why not? Thomas Jefferson described how it was at the beginning of the revolution by writing that the spirit of the Anglicans had subsided into moderation meaning they weren't quite so set on persecution of dissenters. And at the same time, he said that the spirit of the dissenters had risen to a degree of determination which commanded respect. Around that time, the Baptists even sent a petition to the legislature with 10,000 signatures, telling them that they were just going to have to tolerate dissenters for the sake of the cause. That's something I know I referenced earlier, but I just wanted to highlight it again. All right, now we get to the end of the revolution and all these new states trying to determine their way forward. A common sentiment, at least in Virginia, but probably elsewhere too, was this idea that morals were on the decline. I feel like this is something that happens with every generation ever, you know, the kids these days type comments. My dad, you know, he walked five miles to school and it was uphill both ways somehow. And these comments on the morality of the younger generation is extremely common throughout world history, really. Um, so at the beginning, these dissenters, they had just demanded toleration. But now they are thinking that they need more than that. They need solid guarantees of religious freedom. 
Article 16 of Virginia's Declaration of Rights read that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience, and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity toward each other. Now, this sounded really good, but it was a vague promise that didn't really resolve the legal issues for dissenters. A few years later, Thomas Jefferson had proposed a bill for religious freedom, but it had been shot down, perceived as far too radical. So then in 1784, Patrick Henry introduced a bill establishing a provision for teachers of the Christian religion. This was not intended to prohibit the free worship of religious dissenters, but it was meant to tackle this perceived decline in morality by using taxpayer money to fund Christian clergy. All Virginians would be required to pay the tax, but Henry's bill allowed them to choose which Christian denomination they wanted their money to support. When first introduced, the legislature seemed pretty positive towards it, and I'm sure it didn't hurt that most of them were Anglican, like I said. But each time the bill was read, it lost a little of its support. They probably had that you know, inkling that there would be objections if they passed it. So then James Madison convinces them to postpone a vote until the bill could be published in the paper so that Virginians could read it and their constituents would have time to respond. What complicates matters a little bit is that around this same time, the legislature allowed for the incorporation of the Anglican Church, now called the Episcopalian Church, letting them keep all the properties that had been previously purchased through taxpayer funds. So dissenters are feeling doubly attacked for various reasons. I'm not going to talk all that much about the incorporation issue because I really think it's a lesser issue that people were probably only mad about because of the timing. Well, the legislature wanted response, and they got it. In the subsequent petition campaign, about 11,000 Virginians signed against Henry's bill, and only about 1,000 people signed in support of it. Historian Thomas E. Buckley wrote that, quote, the assessment controversy produced a political campaign that exceeded anything Virginia ever experienced before the Civil War, end quote. These petitions also give us a wealth of information about what citizens were thinking, how the thoughts varied by region, and all that good stuff. A lot of the research that's out there seems to focus on the Virginians east of the Blue Ridge, and I really wanted to explore what those along the frontier were saying, and I knew it would probably be a little more controversial because that area had such a large number of dissenters. So I'm going to get into the contents of a few specific petitions from the western part of the state. As usual, there will be a list of the sources that I used in the description box below. So if you just want to read about the petition campaign in general or the you know, the various moves to get these legis- pieces of legislation through, um, you can look through that list and, and read through one of those books or articles to get that general information. Also, these petitions are available as scans from the Library of Virginia, and I will add that link too. So if you want to look specifically at the scan documents, or if you want to look specifically at any petitions submitted by counties that I'm not getting into in this video, you can go do that. The Presbyterian Convention in Augusta asserted in their petition that any time Christianity had been made dependent on earthly governments, that it had introduced corruption among the teachers and professors of it, wherever it has been tried. Patrick Henry had said that his bill was meant to fix a decline in morality, but their petition says state-supported religion had been destructive of genuine morality everywhere it had been tried. Another interesting element of their petition is how they also argued against it for the sake of other denominations and non-Christians. They're not just thinking about themselves, although by ensuring the freedom of other people, they're definitely protecting their own as well. Quote, 
if the assembly have a right to determine the preference between Christianity and the other systems of religion that prevail in the world, they may also, at a convenient time, give a preference to some favored sect among Christians. End quote. That's straight from the Presbyterian Convention of Augusta. There were a number of other frontier petitions that just followed a standard form and said they agreed with the Presbyterian Convention or some where they took copies of James Madison's memorial and remonstrance against Henry's bill and they just kind of added their county name to the top and signed their names at the bottom. Although uh, at that time, Madison had published his memorial anonymously. So they were agreeing with the words, but they didn't actually know who'd written it. There were also a number of unique petitions from Western Virginia that really caught my eye, and I wanted to share some about those. They write their arguments in their own words rather than borrowing those of Madison or the Presbyterian Convention. They mention no religious affiliations. They could have all been of a particular group of dissenters, uh, but they just don't mention it. So, you know, maybe it's one group of dissenters, maybe it's just neighbors in particular county, uh, but they don't mention it. And either way, they had additional thoughts that they wanted to contribute to the discussion. The first I want to bring up is from Rockbridge County, marked as received on November 2nd, 1785. And it says that Henry's bill is wholly foreign to the trust they had placed in their legislature. They claim that the only role of the legislature is the quote unquote secular affairs of public society. They say that the members of each individual congregation should be able to determine how good of a job their clergyman is doing and determine the amount he should or shouldn't be given, that it shouldn't be up to the state to divvy up funds and determine the amounts. The next petition received by the House of Delegates was from Montgomery County, and they received that on November 15th. The petition claimed that the government should be, quote, equally friendly to every species of religion, provided they all tend to the same object, the welfare of the community, end quote. They also seem to claim that morality is not dependent upon religion and anyone is capable of understanding what is right and wrong. They cite the promise of Article 16 in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and they quote it. That's the same article that I read to you earlier. They're also, um, they basically said that the legislature's job was to make civil laws against wrongdoing, and that's it. These Montgomery County residents maintained their, quote, right of judging for ourselves in matters which only concern ourselves, end quote. I love the sass. I, I, you know, I'm trying to imagine how this was phrased by the man who wrote it. Um, And I can't really picture that because it, it kind of seems like Southern woman sass to me. But I guess that's where we got the attitude from. Uh, They were not just concerned about other Christian denominations, though. They're also concerned about other religions altogether. Yes, the assessment allowed taxpayers to choose what denomination to support, but that only worked for Christian denominations. It was unjust, according to them, to force pagans and Muslims to pay taxes in support of Christianity. Yes, I said Muslims. The author of the petition also paraphrased Montesquieu, the Enlightenment theorist, though they just refer to it as a political maxim, which they seem to think everyone was familiar with. Um, And that amuses me because that means they're essentially giving everyone credit for being very well read. And I'm not sure we could even take that for granted in the modern day, but then people perceive this period of, you know, colonial America as being uneducated. I know I've talked about that in other videos on the literacy rate. And at the same time, these people are on the frontier are signing petitions and just assuming that everybody is familiar with Montesquieu. Um, But anyway, the original Montesquieu quote that they're referring to is, quote, in a word, laws which render that necessary, which is only indifferent, 
have this inconveniency, that they make those things indifferent which are absolutely necessary, end quote. At the end, the petition asked the House of Delegates to, quote, remember that the inhabitants of Montgomery unanimously gave their negative to it, end quote. Um, I do kind of wonder how unanimous that was. Like, are they just saying that to try to strengthen their arguments? Or is this something where, like, truly everyone living in Montgomery County was on board with this mentality? All right, so we've covered two of them. Then the next month, on December 10th, also 1785, a petition from Washington County arrived. It had a very serious tone and warned of the impending danger of the highly improper assessment bill. It contained a pretty cynical suggestion that the bill would work better if all men adopted the same set of beliefs, but then immediately dismissed the idea since, quote, that is not the case at present, and in all probability, the prospect of a universal faith far distant, end quote. They were also worried about the hardship it might cause fellow Virginians and what it might mean if potential immigrants who were not Christians decided another country with more liberal laws was a better option. So this is a third petition I found that specifically mentions non-Christians. And honestly, I wasn't expecting that when I started my research. It didn't seem like something they had to talk about. So I really just expected arguments to be specific to Christianity itself. Um, If we're going to sit here and analyze it, I think we could probably make two arguments, really. We could either claim that... They are doing that as a means of protecting their own version of Christianity. Like they're trying to put the line so far out there in the distance that their own ideas will never be attacked. Or we can go with the assumption that they had a genuine concern and did want to welcome people of other faiths like Jews and Muslims. Um, I'm going to leave that up to you. I want... I'm not trying to tell anyone what to decide about that. I just wanted to present their wording to you because I think it's pretty interesting. Anyway, so when the legislature meets again, it is pretty clear what Virginians want from them. They never even take a vote on Henry's bill during the session. It's just toast. At this time, Thomas Jefferson was serving as ambassador to France, so he isn't even present for all this. But James Madison takes the opportunity to reintroduce Jefferson's a bill for establishing religious freedom. And this was the bill that he had tried to introduce a few years before and had been immediately dismissed as too radical. Also, at the same time, Jefferson was writing letters back and forth during this whole controversy. He just wasn't present in Virginia for what was going on. His bill is passed in January of 1786 with only minor changes, what Jefferson calls some mutilations to the preamble. Freedom of religion, based on the First Amendment, the freedom of religion as we know it now, didn't emerge until the 1940s. Even though Jefferson's bill only applied to Virginia, it was used as Supreme Court precedent for the entire nation. In his autobiography, Thomas Jefferson described how the majority of the legislature rejected the possible addition of the words Jesus Christ to the statute. This, he claimed, proved their intent to also protect the religious liberty of, quote, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and Mahometan, the Hindu and infidel of every denomination, end quote. So there you have it the background behind part of our religious freedom as we know it in the United States today. I hope you found this interesting. Like I said, all my sources, all of that material is in the description box. If you're interested, please make sure to like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I would love to hear your thoughts below.